Ken contacted me a number of weeks ago after an interview I had actually done on News Talk. And I had actually spoken about having ADHD and what it was like living with it. And Mark Cagney was doing the interview. <clears throat> so when Mark or when Ken asked me, would I would I give this webinar? I says, yeah, most definitely would, you know, whatever help I can actually give ADHD Ireland. But I'm not going to sugarcoat what I'm going to say. I'll either actually be honest. And it's one of the characteristics we have as ADHD is that we are brutally honest. So I know we have over 400 people in tonight at this webinar. I can tell you now, I don't know who's actually in, but I can guarantee you that at least two thirds of them are mums. There's probably about another 20 or 30 who are actually health professionals and probably a number of teachers. For mums and for people with ADHD, all right, I'm hoping that you will get a lot out of this because I'm going to talk about my experience of living with ADHD, what my experience was growing up. But I'm going, as you notice with the gray hair, I'm going to focus on the how it pertains to your child or your presentation or whatever it is you have today. So I'm only, I'm not going to go in like they got rid of the strap years ago. So the days of, you know, it being bet out of you, all right, as being the drug of choice may have gone. But the philosophy underneath it is still exactly the same. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And if you are a professional, I hope you do stay because I will actually talk from a professional perspective, but I'm going to actually describe what the lived experience is of the people who are coming to see you because I'm seeing it every day. So anyway, where we start off, all right, is that in order to start, we're going to have to hit it from two angles. The two angles is, is what is the problem? Why does it occur the way it does? What is relevant? Okay. Why does each characteristic of ADHD occur? And what more importantly, can you actually do about it? And when we actually look about what you can do about it, we are going to start focusing on what we should not be doing about it. And that's going to be probably about 80% of what I'm hoping health professionals will take out of this. All right. Because there's, Three definitions, all right? There's a definition of a profession. And if you're a teacher or you're a health profession or a doctor or a nurse or a therapist or anything like that, you're supposed to operate of certain professional character competencies. And I'm going to focus on three of them tonight. And the first is, is that everything you should do should be evidence-based practice. You take the evidence, you base your practice on it, you check the efficacy of what you're doing and that reflects more practice. And that's what we should all be doing. The second is one of the characteristics of a, of a profession is self-reflection. 30% of your time should always be reflecting back on what you're doing. And the most important part of that self-reflection is what's called non-malevolence, which is above all, do no harm. Now, I'm going to come back to those three characteristics of what professional is supposed to be as we go through the talk. But about my own experience is, I'm an, what Ken didn't actually say is that before I was ever a therapist, I was actually a psychiatric and a general nurse. I was a specialist in emergency room medicine in America. And I was working in an ER, an emergency room in Harlem in New York. And my boss, pointed it out to me one day and says, you know, you've actually got ADHD. And I had no idea because at that stage, I just thought I was mad. I just thought I was unique. You know, I was in a very bad place and I was just functioning. All right. Because of where the world had been. All right. What the world was for me. But she had actually ADHD. Once I started hearing the term, because this is back in 1992, it was 30 years ago. So it wasn't fully understood. I had no idea what it was about. I was working in emergency room. Hope in God's name, would you know about that? But when I looked into it and I spoke to a number of people who had ADHD, I realized, Jesus, that's what was wrong with me all those years. And it was an eye opener for me. And I came back to Ireland not long afterwards. I decided, listen, I have a lot going on in my head that I need to sort out. So I came back. But the most important thing I realized when I came back, because I had worked as a psychiatric nurse, I'd done a lot of training, okay? I was highly qualified at what I did. But I knew that what my experience was and what everything I had actually learned and what I was seeing about not only ADHD, but mental health in perspective, 
had absolutely no bearing on either my experience and I knew that nothing that was out there would actually help me because it was completely alien to what my experience was. Now, things have improved somewhat over the last 30 years, but there's still massive gaps that aren't being covered. And I'm hoping to focus on the major one tonight. So if any professionals are listening in, cover this angle and you'll at least have overcome the professional non-malevolence of doing no harm. So a couple of, it must have been about four or five years later, I was actually at a conference. I think it was DCU, I think it was. And they were talking about DSM-4, which is this massive big tome. It's like a, a phone directory, old phone directory. And it's got a, char a characterization. It has a classification of every mental illness you could talk about. But this particular one was actually talking about ADHD. And they had a lot of very, very, very qualified clinicians who had come over and were talking about this. All right. And I was listening and I was listening and I was listening. And when they asked for questions, I said, I, again, I just put up my hand. I couldn't resist. All right. We're impulsive. All right. And I said, when you are coming up with all of these classifications and all of these criteria and DSM-4s and all this thing, how many people with ADHD did you actually have on your review body that you actually spoke to? And the answer was none. They had absolutely none. They'd never spoken to them. They had actually decided that they were going to sit outside. They were going to look at us. And it's not just ADHD. It goes for autism, because I might as well be upfront with you. A large number of people who have ADHD have an underlying autism going on as well. All right. But they had never spoken to them. And the analogy I actually use is I, you know, with 400 people in, I don't know who's here, but I can guarantee you that probably about 70, 80 percent of them are women. So the analogy I'm going to use, all right, is I want you to imagine you're a woman in Victorian England. And everything that is actually understood about women is understood through a male understanding because all the doctors are male, all the physicians are male, all the clinicians are male, everybody's male, everybody in any form of power is male. And they are going to understand you. And because you are very, very different to them and to us as males, and of course the vice versa goes the same, if you're the only man in all woman world, then what will happen is, is that you will end up looking, all right, and the, we will think, oh, do you know what? You actually react in a very different way to me. Now, the normal is that you should love football. And the normal is you should deal with your emotions in a certain way. And the normal is you should do this than the other. So if you do it differently, then we'll call it hysteria, which is after the Latin word for uterus, because it's obviously to do with you're a female. Now, what you've actually learned and what women learned 100 years ago, and it was right up until recent times, all right, was that you never learned in those days how the quintessential experience of what a woman was, how they think differently, how they are unique in their own way, all right? Everything was viewed through male eyes. So you did not grow up learning how to be a woman. You grew up learning that you had a woman disorder. And once you put the word disorder into the sentence, everything you try to do to overcome it is going to get the opposite result. And that was one of the major topics of my first book, Five Steps, was that the abnormalization, and it doesn't matter, I don't care what kind of language you use, because it was, we'll find out, instead of saying we punish kids, we now say we sanction them. But the language has changed. This has become much more, you know, like kind of uh, politically correct, but it's still exactly the same. And what happens is, is, you know, the, the whole language that is actually used is that you never learn how to be yourself. You're always compared to somebody else. So you never learn you know, how to excel with your own skills, how to excel with who you are, how to excel as a unique individual in your own right. And 
I have ADHD and our producer, Damien Purcell, if you Google him from VML Technologies, all right, who was very, very successful in his own career, has ADHD too. But by actually embracing who we were rather than what everybody else wanted us to be, we both became incredibly successful at what it is we do. So what you do is, is once you say I have a disorder or a condition, no matter what language you used after that, you can call it, oh, you have a condition, all right? That was the latest one I got. Because I tried to help somebody understand, I put in the word disorder. I will, you know, we don't say disorder anymore. We say you have a condition. All right? <laughs> What's the difference? Because once you do, what you're doing is, is you're saying, I am different to you. And when you say that to a child, or you say that to a teenager, no matter what language you put to it, you're rejecting them out of your normal community. And what you're doing is, is that you can use flowery language and you can say, oh, do you know what? We'll help you. And please, it's okay to be not okay. But you're still mad. All right? And kids, especially kids with ADHD, you know, we are incredibly sensitive. We understand exactly what you're saying. And we pick up the nonverbals, no matter how much you try to, 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 to kind of to hide them. And when you use this disorder term, you will then implement strategies which are the equivalent to us as gay conversion therapies were to gay people 20 years ago. We'll cure you. We will show you how not to be gay. I'll show you how, to, as a woman, I'll show you oh, how to understand and love football. I'm sure when I don't succeed, well, you know, it's, it's really that you're not engaged with this at all, are you? So you'll just have to accept that you're just less, aren't you? Because that's what, that's what we get. And that's what I actually got. Now, you didn't have the term ADHD, okay? When I found out, I talked to my dad, and my mum was dead at that stage, but she's, you know, I, she had actually spoken to a, a priest out in Mount Argus here in Rathgar, all right? And he was a psychologist, all right? Because at that day, you know, I had briars in my pants. It was like I had barbed wire in my pants, all right? And when she spoke to him and says, what do we do, all right? His advice to her, and this was back in the 70s, in the mid late 70s, he said, love him as he is. Don't love him as how you think he should be. And that's what my mum and my dad tried to do for me. But as you have found out as a parent, 90% of the problem that your child and that you have with ADHD has nothing to do with ADHD. It's coping with their world out there and what people are doing and how they're aggravating. And I'm going to prove that. I'm going to show that how that actually happens. So where the problem with ADHD, before I get in to the characteristics, is that 30% of the characteristics are ADHD related. Yes, I do have briars in my pants, okay? But if you view it through a paradigm, and a paradigm is how professionals understand a, a subject, but if you view it through a paradigm, then what you're going to do is, is you're going to view these as, well, that's a disorder, that's a, you know, that's a characteristic of this, and that's something that has to be cured. But how do you cure it? You try and make me like you. So the more I try and make you think and act and understand like a man, the more abnormal of a woman you're going to be. And that is seven, what's behind 70% of the actual problems that people with ADHD have. The same way with autism. It's the same way with dyspraxia. It's the same way with dyslexia. All right. It's this inherent abnormalization by putting the word disorder at the end of the sentence. Now, do I actually have learning needs? Yes, I do. I'm a human being. I still have learning needs. Your children have learning needs. But if you turn around to me and say that my learning needs, that because they're actually different to yours, that I'm in some way disordered and you have to teach me to think like a little girl or a little girl to think like a little boy, then you're going to do intense damage. And that's the 70% that I'm going to focus on. All right. So as regards the other 30%, we're told where it is we should be, but we're never told or shown or instructed how to get there. 
So it's a bit like the analogy I use is, you know how to drive a car. I don't know how to drive a car. Would you think that the normal and normal people can drive themselves to Galway? So I says, well, how do you drive a car? And says, but sure, everybody knows how to drive a car. Everybody knows how to read a map. Everybody knows how to Google Maps. So if we can't get to Galway, then that's obviously something wrong with us. And that has to be cured. All right. So yes, all right, the learning needs in a little girl are the learning different to the learning needs that a little boy will have. But they're no different to each other. They're just different. And if you start with the word disorder, and this is the problem I have with masses and masses of, of you know, assessments and psychological reports. You know, I read them all the time. And they are that thick, all right, of, you know, assessment, which is measurable. So that that thick of assessment, when you look at the actual solution at the end of it, they're incredibly vague. All right. So, you know, I've, you know, had a dealings with a, a school and some schools are brilliant. All right. Some schools are absolutely brilliant. I had dealings with the school there about three weeks ago. And when the child was brought to the actual school and the parents went up and said, listen, can you help us? They never once asked for an, a psychological assessment. They just says, what's the worst thing he's done? And of course they had to say, he <laughs> decked one or two people. And he says, oh, well, in that case, we'll just keep social distancing. And says, bring him in. Let's see, all right, what it's like. Just let's see what he's like. And if we can help, we can help. And if we can't, we can't. And within two weeks, that child, all right, has a stature that is nearly six foot above where they were two weeks beforehand. To be able to say, and I'll give him a plug, it's Kilsara National School. It's probably one of the best schools I've ever seen in the entire country. So if Rory or anybody else from the school is listening in there, all right, I'm gobsmacked with what they've actually done. Because what they did was, was that they met him, all right, where he was. They met the child that he is. And they never once used a diagnosis or used a disorder. They just understood him as a child. And that's what we need to do. So, for 30% of the problems are ADHD related, and I'll go over to those, but that'll take me about 10 minutes. 40% are as a result of trying to get me to be like you. The other 30%, unfortunately, are as a result of the bullying, the rejection, and the isolation that are imposed upon us and imposed upon you as parents by health professionals and by the teaching profession. And I'll be upfront. And if there's any teachers listening in, please stay tuned in. I will explain why that is actually happening. So we're always told where we need to be, but we're never shown how to get there. And as parents, you know, you're told where your child should be. But nobody ever explains to you how to actually get there. And you'll see the little plug there, if I can get it there. Oh, oh where am I? Oh, yeah, supporting adults. That's the program that myself, Damien, and a few others actually run. And it's supporting adults, support young people. Because the conversation you, if you send your child to me for therapy, the conversation you want them to have with me is the conversation they're trying to have with you. So is it not much more effective to try and teach you what to do? Because it's not rocket science. If you can train a 20-year-old to be a health professional, you can train a parent how to understand their child and just understand them as the person they are. So if you want more information, the book is down there. But anyway, I'm not here just to give a plug to the program, all right? We're never shown how to understand this. And a simple example of that that we'll see later as I go through is children with a, all children are visual learners. We don't read, we don't learn by reading a book. We learn by watching. And when we come to looking at how do you try and educate somebody with ADHD? You'll find that everything you need is on YouTube and everything they need is on YouTube. It's on TED Talks. And if you do it the same way as the computer games industry does it to engage your child, I had one example there where I had a young fellow with me there about, must have been about, that was a couple of weeks ago. And he really struggling in school. He's 16, 17 years of age. All right, coming up to his leaving cert. And I said, do you ever understand anything that they're saying? He says, I can't even zone in. Okay. 
And I says, OK, I want you to do a little experiment. And the experiment I did was, was that I got a little YouTube channel. And you can check this out yourself. It's called Geography Now. And it's these two guys who obviously came from the computer games industry who decided to do a whole series on geography. And they do one in Ireland. All right. And I got them to watch it. Now, if you watch it yourself, it is so fast. It is literally at light speed the way they're given the information. It's 12 minutes long and they cover the entire political and physical geography of Ireland in 12 minutes. So you can imagine the speed they're actually doing. And they also cover in 30 seconds what they didn't cover here, but it's worth your while looking into it, all right? And I saw, I showed him watching it and for 12 minutes he was totally engaged because it engaged him. And then when he came offline, I turned around to him, I says, okay, name the seas around Ireland. And he had them off like a trash. I says, what's the largest lake in Ireland? He says, Lochnay. I says, what's the second largest lake? Now, he had never done geography before because he had actually come from another country. I says, what's the second largest lake? <laughs> second largest lake. He said, Loch Corrib. I says, how many counties in Ireland? He says, north or south? <laughs> and I knew. And what he couldn't re understand, what he couldn't grasp was by not even having to think about it, he had grasped all this. So, we are visual learners. And what we do is, all right, is that we utilize strategies to educate people, all right, that were developed three, 400 years ago. So learn what it looks like and how I teach kids with ADHD. We're visual learners. We need to conceptualize what it is we're doing. So if you have a topic in history or you a topic in science or a topic in maths, find yourself a good YouTube video, 12 minutes or less, that just gives you an overview of it just a snapshot of it. So you can see the whole picture of the jigsaw. And now read your book and suddenly you'll start to understand where all the pieces come in. And if you get lost, go back to your video. And if you introduce that tiny little intervention with kids with ADHD, you can radically alter their attention span. You can radically alter their concentration and you'll radically alter their confidence in being able to learn and you'll get them to engage. And all I'm doing is a simple technique that the computer games industry has been using since I was since Space Invaders. They're doing the same thing. Now, symptoms of ADHD and what they actually mean. So the first symptom is concentration. Now, if you read the books, they'll say, we have difficulties concentration, or we zone out, or whatever it is. That is complete, utter, absolute rubbish. We have better concentration than you do. But you have the brain, neurotypical people have a brain like a cart horse. You focus on one thing, then you focus on another thing and you plod along in your cart. We have a brain like a racehorse. Now, if you take a racehorse and try and get it to act like a cart horse, what's going to happen? It's not going to work. But we have, a, so we don't focus on one thing at a time. We are able to focus men, <laughs> two men who can multitask because we do everything, all right, multitasking. So if I'm cleaning my house, I'll start in the kitchen. I'll eventually find something that needs to go upstairs. I bring upstairs, all right, and I start cleaning that room. And then I find something that has to go to the bathroom and I bring it over to the bathroom. And instead of cleaning the house one room at a time that you may do it and that you try and teach us to do it. I clean the entire house at the same time. Similarly, I'm a model maker. I always have about five different projects going on at the same time. Similarly with this, all right, I don't work at one job, as you heard in my introduction, I have about five jobs. And when I get bored with one, I jump onto the other one and then onto the other one and then onto the other one and then I come back to the first one. I don't write my, my books all right, one chapter at a time. I write all 20 chapters at the same time and I'm constantly hopping between one and two. And it's very, very effective, all right? Since lockdown came in, I've started writing for Irish Country Life, which is the, the health section of the Irish Farmers Journal. And with Amy McKeever there, all right, I've learned a hell of a lot about how to write from the heart, but how to write incredibly fast. And that's what I do. And I'm a two finger typist. So that's what I'm able to do. So. You see this as a hyperactivity. It's not. 
it's me focusing on loads of things at the same time. Similarly, okay, when you look at this, is that we can see the world as it actually is, not the hypothetical sociological world that you see. So we can see all the uh, all the bullshit that actually goes on. And we find it's, we understand, people say we don't understand the world. We don't pick up social cues. We do, but we just don't know what to do about them because we honestly don't know what it is you want us to do. So if you're a woman in an all male world at a football match, will you pick up every single social cue that all the men are doing? No, you won't. You probably will, but you won't know how to react to it. Do I hit them a box or do I actually walk away? Similarly, if you put me in a world that has all women in it, what I'll do is I will probably pick up, you know, the kind of all picture, no sound, you know, the atmosphere is warm as a pharaoh's tomb when I've done something wrong, but I don't know how to react to it because I don't know what reaction is actually required. And that's the world that we actually live in. The second characteristic that we have, but it's not that it's, it's just that I do it completely differently, but nobody ever shows us how to thrive in the world using the, the racehorse that we have. They think, no, you have to sit down and you have to put yourself into the cart and you have to do it our way. And the more you try and get me to do it your way, the more abnormal I'll be because it's like putting a racehorse into, in behind a cart. The second is procrastination, all right? Now, procrastination is laziness in five syllables. So if you're procrastination, I'm putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And if, you have, if you've got ADHD, you're going to find that you have this. What you actually do have, all right, is that you're like a Ferrari without a starting motor. See, the neurotypical world thinks you get into a car, you turn the key, and therefore the engine starts and you head off. What they don't realize is that one of the differences I have is that I don't have a starting motor, so you can turn, get me to turn a key as much as you want, but it's not actually going to, uh, you know, to do anything. So I have to push start my car every time I want to do something. Now, if it's something I find very enjoyable or something that has real interest for me or something that I think will be useful to me, all right, then I'm push starting the car downhill. If it's something that I think has no use for me or I don't see the purpose of it, it's like push starting a car uphill. I can't do it. But who's going to teach me how to push start? Because every time you hear, okay, people talking about this, they'll say, well, he just won't sit down. Yeah, I know. He doesn't have a starting motor. But they think that we should automatically have it. And if we don't sit down, well, we're not motivated. And as we look at later on, we have better motivation than you do. See, motivation is easy when you want to do it. If you figured out how education works, all right, you don't need much motivation to go in and work at it because you can see what you're going to get. Real motivation comes from doing something when you absolutely don't want to do it. And that's where we live. Because I was talking at a group one day, it was an applied leaving cert. And I says, who's got the biggest, and most of them have ADHD, all right? And I said, who's got the greatest commitment to education? You are the A class. And of course, they said the A class. And I said, no, you do. Because the A class have figured out how it works. So they don't need much motivation. They can see they're going to go to college. I says, how many of you love coming to school? Mm -hmm. Right. And I says, how many of you absolutely hate coming into school? And they all put up their hand. And I says, but you still come in. So who's got the greater commitment to actual education? Similarly, all right, one of them who had been pointed out to me as being probably the one they were most worried about, I was gobsmacked because I was living in Dublin at the time. And I had actually recognized him in the class because I had actually recognized him from working part time in one of the local shops. And in my head, haven't seen him because remember, I'm a behavioral psychologist. So they say a dentist doesn't remember you. He or she rem they remember your teeth. Well, I actually notice behaviors. And I remember seeing him about two weeks previous in one of my local shops in Port Marnock, thinking to myself, 
if I need a young fella to do a few jobs for me, I definitely know who I'm going to head on. So this person who was failing at the traditional kind of educational thing, I had already earmarked. I says, he's never going to have much of a problem. And you put a kid with ADHD into a job and you'll find they'll never go sick. They actually won't go sick. Because when I was actually leaving Mount Sinai Hospital, I went to them. I said, listen, I've just realized of ADHD. I think of a lot that I need to sort out here. And the HR department says, oh, that's very interesting. And it says, listen, take two years, but would you come back to us in two years time? And I says, okay. Thinking they'd just be nice to me. All right. And it wasn't because two years to the day that I left, I received a lovely, lovely letter. I mean, it was all letters in those days from the actual HR department, from the person I dealt with in the HR department saying, hope everything's going well. And uh, if you're interested in coming back, we'd love you to come back and work for me. And I actually found out that this hospital actually had a recruitment policy that 10% of their, uh, to 10% of their kind of workforce were all neuroatypical, alcoholic, extra addict in some way and the reason that they had that was not just to kind of play some lip service to our cultural diversity or something like that it was because they had recognized that people who are neurodiverse in a variety of different ways are excellent in certain ways and make excellent workers so that was the reason my boss had adhd and the reason i knew it was so the procrastination is rubbish but i do need to learn OK, how to push that. But as a result of nearly everything else that happens to us, any motivation or any confidence that we could actually have to motivate ourselves or to do something has been beaten out of us for, from, the, from the moment we're born. OK, because, all right, and we'll find it later on, OK, that, that, that we have, unfortunately, with ADHD, we have a condition or whatever it is you want to call it that is socially unacceptable because it upsets the order of your world and what do you do well christian brothers betted out of us although my experience of christian brothers was i went to first class in christian brothers and my only memory of that first class was warmth feeling loved and feeling accepted all right they went to another school which that's where the problem actually started, but it wasn't Christian Brothers that did it. Similarly, as social cues, I've just briefed it. Can somebody kindly tell me what a bloody social cue is? Because I've spent the last 20 years trying to figure out what it is. And can you tell me that if X happens, then the social response should be Y, all right? Because we're told, oh, there's social cues, and I'm sure everybody picks up on that. No, they don't, because it doesn't exist. Your normal world doesn't actually exist, and we can actually see that. You can't. But we can see it. Anybody who's neurodiverse realizes the problem isn't us. The problem is you think there's some kind of normal out there that doesn't actually exist. And it's incredibly vague. But when we try to do it, it doesn't work for us. So, OK, male into a female world, female into a male world. Do what you want. I can see what I'm seeing. You can't. OK, the one that we're going to go on to is the one where is probably very specific to ADHD. And that's what's commonly referred to as oppositional and conduct defiant disorder. And this is where the most damage is actually done for us because we are seen as socially unacceptable because we upset the orderly running of your world. So we live our lives constantly trying to defend ourselves against your hostile world which you create by constantly criticizing us and punishing us for not being like you and codes of behavior in school adopt a philosophy that was discredited and is illegal in every other field of life but was discredited as abusive all right 30 years ago and if any of you are running into problems, which you are, okay, you're running into problems with school where you're now being told the code of behavior. And I want you to read a document by Tuzla, and it is developing a code of behavior for schools. And it's about seven or eight pages long. And the first two pages were written by Tuzla. And it says that all children's 
behavior is as a result and a reaction to the environment they're in. So before you can ever try and deal with any type of behavior you don't want, it is not the child you have to look at, it is the environment that you're in. And as you will find, the only environment that is actually focused on is your home environment. Now I'm saying you're probably as much a joy to live with as I am, and you're as effective a parent as I am. But my experience is, is that, yeah, there's usually a, you know, kid is driving everybody nuts, all right? But parents usually resolve it very easy with the proper advice. And then you have to look, well, where's the behavior? Where's the behavior actually happening? And the behavior is happening in the school. And then he says, okay, well, what's the attitude of the school towards you? Now, as I said at the start, some schools are brilliant. Some schools are okay. Some schools don't understand much, but, you know, they do their best. But there are schools out there that I wouldn't trust to walk my dog, never mind actually educate my child. But as you have found out already, there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Because everything is designed. You're the problem. Never us. And when we come down to looking at what I call institutional narcissism, I will describe it for you. So what happens is, is that codes of behavior tend to gloss over the first two pages of that document, which is the relationship you have with these t this child. And they focus solely on rejection. We will isolate you. Now, can somebody, all right, remember, go back to the whole purpose, what I said at the start of a profession. Self-reflection, non-malevolence, and evidence-based practice. Somebody kindly tell me, all right, where the evidence is that excluding them Excluding us, punishing us, isolation actually is the therapy of choice because that is what codes of behavior do. Yes, there's bullying, but, it, you know, I deal with bullying as a clinician, all right? The person who needs the most help in a bullying case is the one who's doing the bullying, all right? And some schools understand that, but other schools don't. So corporal punishment has actually gone out. And it went out when I was about, just before, I think it was still there when I left school, all right? But it went out not long afterwards. But the philosophies behind corporal punishment are still exactly the same as they were. And I'll be honest with you, I've had two schools in the last three or four months, all right? Now, I have one school and a couple of schools that have no behavior problems because they do everything right. But I've had two experiences of two schools and I live in the Northeast and these schools know who they are. And at some stage, if they ever wish to discuss it on air with me, either in news talk or here or with our own YouTube channel, I quite happily discuss their behavior. But they are actually boasting that they don't have behavioral problems in their school. And that's because they've got rid of them all. They've constructively dismissed them. They create an environment. Constructive dismissal is an actual environment whereby I will make it so difficult for you, all right? I will make it so difficult for you that you have no option but to leave. And that's what they do. And they have their own way of doing it. I'm sure many of you have heard the expression, oh, well, maybe this isn't the right school for you. <laughs> Once I hear that, I tell parents, get your child out of there because there's nothing you can do. You have to get out, all right? And that's what happens. Because when we come across a hostile environment, we are pig-headedly stubborn. Unfortunately, we are. So if you come after us, we will dig in the heels. And that's what I do, all right? I'm a thick as a donkey, all right? I can be as thick as a mule. And I'm at me most dangerous when I'm in the right, if I'm in the wrong, I have some hope of me saying, okay, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong. But if I think I'm in the right, I'll dig in my heels, all right? And that's nothing to do with ADHD. It's just to do with just my personality, 
all right? But I have had examples, all right, whereby I have had examples whereby I've said to people, all right, you know, look at the school you're actually in and watch the person that they're having difficulty with because I do see it and they do know they're doing it. Because with somebody with ADHD, if you want to get them, the easiest way of getting them out of your school is prod them. When they react, get them on the reaction. And I've seen that being deliberately done. And once again, what can you do about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing you can do about it. So that's where corporal punishment gets us. So life for us is like living in a minefield. We constantly walk around walking on social landmines or behavioral landmines because we have no idea what to. You think we are doing all of these things just to sod you off. We're not. I lived my life. I couldn't see that for most of the time. I was actually doing what was expected of me, all right? Because nobody ever told me. And I lived my life lurching from one crisis to another. And the world and I just waited for the next crisis to occur. And it's called intermittent reinforcement. So I was going to walk on another landmine and it was going to happen fairly, fairly quickly. And all I had to do was walk on one landmine every two or three months. And sure, that just showed how, I, how bad I was. So as a result of the behavior, we're rejected out of your community, either by your diagnosis, all right, or we're rejected out of your community by your codes of behavior. So by being rejected and isolated, all right, as teenagers, the loneliness we feel is crushing. I lived with it for 28 years. It is crushing, all right? It is everlasting, and it is our only companion. And you watch your child with ADHD, no matter how nice you try to be, if you are operating those three things that I've discussed, that's the result your child is, is actually having. So all we have learned from the world by the time we get to 18 or 19 is that we're assholes. And that's all I learned. And that was the title of this talk. The only thing I learned in life was that I was an asshole. And I was surrounded by a society that made sure I never forgot that. And I was reminded of it every single day. So how people react to us. Well, 90% of people, we are just background noise to them. Just the odd guy who's over in the corner. Okay. 10% they decide they're our judge and jury. Okay. And they decide that, you know what? That's what we're going to do. And that's including parents, two parents. They will decide that they're the judge and jury of you because if their intervention is working, well, it's obviously your fault. And I remember parents being told that. The school were behaving appallingly. The health services that they were getting were useless. They were absolutely, they had no bearing on evidence. They had no bearing on anything. But the only person, and the parents were brought in and told, you're not disciplining him properly. And you know what? We're going to do it for you. And that's why all these kids ended up in industrial schools. Except now, we don't end up in industrial schools. We just end up getting kicked out, and we end up in prison. And that's where we go. All right? So why does that happen? Well, by the invalidated environment, what I do, and you can check this out in invalidated environments. We have known this for 30 years. This was first described by Marsha Linham back in the early 90s, all right? Dialectic behavior therapy. Because by failing to acknowledge our reality or understand it, we're never taught how to understand it. And by failure to understand and teach us how to deal with the reality, okay, and we not living in your world, it's seen as a lack of motivation or a character defect in us. It's your disorder, all right? Or it's a behavioral thing, okay? which means then that we end up in a world of what's called dis emotional dysregulation. So emotional dysregulation is that over my hand, I've skin, all right? If you scratch me, it doesn't hurt. But if I grow up in this type of environment, and it's not just unique to ADHD, it's to do with every child I end up seeing for therapy. We don't grow this emotional skin. So little things hurt us a hell of a lot. So when we get upset, we don't just get upset, okay, the way you would get upset. We go from 0 to 90 because we have no regulation skills to stop ourselves going 0 to 90. 
So the blowouts we have is that you've never shown us how to put a rain on the thing. All right. And how the hell am I going to do that? And by intermittently punishing us, you're reinforcing, all right, where we will oscillate between emotional inhibition in an order to be accepted to extreme emotional states in order to be heard. And that was diagnosed, or that was described 30 years ago. All right, but you probably, this is the first time that you've actually heard it was tonight. So get getting help. Where do you do? What do you do? First is there's three principles of a profession. One, non-malevolence. Above all, do no harm. Two, self-reflective. And three, anything you do is, is evidence-based. Now, as a therapist, all right, mental health isn't rocket science. And what I do isn't rocket science. It is actually quite simple. Because underneath our cultural superficial differences, we are do all kind of tick very, very similar to each other. And we call it the golden minute. Because if you listen to somebody uninterrupted for one minute, they will tell you everything you need to know to help them in that one minute. And if you're really good at what you do, you can hear that in about 20 seconds. And what happens then is, all right, is that if you're seeing me, okay, I'll listen for the golden minute. I'll tell you, all right, what I think is actually happening. All right. You may not like the answer. You may not like what I actually say. But it will be very, very clear about what the problem is and what we need to do about it. Because, you know, you know, kind of, you know, as I was saying to Ken earlier on, all right, yeah, you will understand that you're as mad as a brush, but you're no madder than myself, all right? Because your concept of normal doesn't exist. So if you weren't correct in this problem, you'd be correct in some other problem. And that's life, okay? But if you end up looking for help, you look at the actual science regarding interventions that used. What's the scientific basis to it? So if they say, do something, what is it? What problem? So if you are going to the health services, I'm taking a stab at the teaching profession, but now I want to take a stab, all right, at my own profession. I want to take a stab at the health professions because most, all the parents that are listening to this, this is your experience. I see it every day, all right? But ask them, what do they think the problem is? And it should be fairly clear. They should be able to explain it to you in a few minutes and explain it in a way that you keep to understand that it makes it fairly easy for you. So one of the characteristics, if you do a master's degree, is your ability to take masses of scientific evidence and re re translate it into language that is very easily understood. That's the characteristic of an expert. And if they can't actually do that, then they either don't know what the problem is or they're not very expert at what they're doing. So I'm not saying we have enough of experts. What I am actually saying is I'm questioning a lot of experts' expertise, and I'm basing it on those streets. Where's your evidence to support your argument? All right. So what problem are you trying to ask them? What problem are you trying to address? What intervention are you going to use? How are you going to measure its efficacy? How are you going to measure this? All right. And what, what you will find is that whilst, you know, kind of you'll get bucket loads of assessments, that the most of the interventions that are used are vague, all right? They don't really teach you what to do, okay? And especially the behavioral interventions have absolutely no scientific basis to them. They're based on pseudoscience. So by the time you're finished with us, we don't need outsiders to invalidate us. Our emotional brain does the same. It becomes this constant loop tape going on in our heads. And that's why people who are neurodiverse have such a high suicide rate, because nobody shows us what to do. So medications. Don't never use them myself, all right? I wouldn't trust myself, because if you gave me a medication for that and it worked brilliantly, my next thought would be, I wonder what would happen if I took two of them. <laughs> right? So I wouldn't trust myself with things like that. Okay. But medications do work. All right. They are brilliant. They do exactly what they said in the tent. I had a reason there that I needed a guy. All right. In California. All right. That I was dealing with over Zoom. And I said, listen, I would like to get a diagnosis here because I think medication probably would help. And I'm not anti medication. All right. They do exactly what they said in the tent. But they're a means towards an end. They are not an end in itself, all right? And they must always be used 
as part of a toolbox, not as the toolbox, all right? But one of the questions I did ask anyway, was that he says, it's imp nearly impossible to get a diagnosis and get somebody to give you a diagnosis of ADHD in California. I says, what? And he says, yeah. And I says, how did that work? <laughs> I would have thought it was the exact opposite. And he said, no, because everybody wants the diagnosis. All the college kids want the diagnosis so they can get the Adderall because the medications are so bloody brilliant is that they do exactly what they say in the tin. They will improve your concentration. They'll improve your functioning. They'll help you be normal if that's what you want to do. My attitude is, is if they are that successful and if they are that good, then why aren't they given to every child? And whenever I ask a clinician that, why don't you give it to every child? Oh, well, they wouldn't be indicated. Why not? All right. Why give them to us? So if medication works for you, go ahead. I know people who do it and they work very well. All right. I know also new. Okay. But if they work for you, fine. But they have to be used. All right. As part of the thing. Anyway. So what do we need to do? Children learn what they live. The hardest, the children learn what they live. They react to their environment. If they live with bullying, rejection and isolation, they will learn that they're rejects and they will kick back. And that's where all the opposition behavior is going on. All right. We oscillate between emotional inhibition in order to be accepted and extreme emotional states in order to be heard. All right. As a parent, a an, an example is a colleague of mine, Mary, all right, down in Galway, who's a GP. She has a wonderful expression. She says, a mother's place is in the wrong. If you're a mom, you're to blame for everything. Because not only are you blaming yourself, but by the same process of intermittent reinforcement, well, you know, the neighbor's child isn't kicking off like that. So it's obviously your fault, all right? And once you're getting that in the ear by either attitude or you're getting it in the ear by some other things, all right, gradually that voice starts in your head. So the concepts I've been giving you have been known for 30 years. They should actually be as common as oxygen, but they're not. So some of us, OK, try to defend ourselves, but your world is too strong, so there's nothing you can do. But the only fault that would be accepted is actually yours. Now, coming up to eight o'clock, I'm going to talk till about ten past, quarter past eight, if that's OK. All right. The point I want to point out is what I call institutional narcissism. Now, narcissism, OK, if you Google it, you'll find out. OK, there was a judge back in 1921 who, who repealed Prohibition, 23, I think it was, all right? And he said, there's no greater danger to society than the insidious encroachment of people of zeal, well-intentioned, but with little understanding. And unfortunately, when we come to dealing with ADHD and with a lot of other pro behavior problems, okay, we, do, we run into this narcissistic. And the narcissist creed is, if in relationships is, that didn't happen. And if it did, it wasn't that bad. And if it was that bad, well, we didn't mean it. And if we did mean it, well, you obviously deserved it. Now, that's victim blaming. When you come, is that that didn't happen. So if you try to sit across the table and say, listen, what are you doing here, lads? Because a lot of you, most of you, all right, are sitting there pulling your hair out, okay, trying to get people, am I the only one seeing there's something majorly wrong here? And they're totally blind to it because they are incapable of self-reflection, which is the narcissistic trait, okay? As an organization, okay? As a health service, as a CAMS service. And I know we have our YouTube channel launching now in the next week or two, all right? I have a couple of parents who, when they did go to the local CAMS service and looked for help, found that they were beating their head against a brick wall. I remember somebody, I telling somebody, the hardest part you will have will never be your child. The hardest part will be sitting across the table from a professional who thinks they're the only ones who know anything and that you know not only know nothing, but that you're the main part of the blame. So the second part of the narcissist creed that you will get, all right, is if they are doing something, well, it's not that bad. Well, we, we, you don't understand, they will ignore it. And it's not that bad, but we really need to focus on your behavior, all right? And if it is, you know, if they do make a mistake, they'll say, oh, well, we have lessons to learn and we'll do with this. And then, of course, they ignore it and they continue on and make the same mistakes again. All right. But then they will fall back that if you try to confront them, you have become a problem and they will go for you and they will actually 
shut us up, drawbridge up, and that's it. You're out because you're to blame. So the only people who will be looked at, okay, will be either your child's behavior or it'll be yours. Now, remember, you're not purer than the driven snow, okay? But my experience is, is that the vast majority of problems that are associated with ADHD, 20% of them are in the family, 80% of them are by lack of understanding, okay, from professional organizations. Because the primary purpose of a bureaucracy is to protect itself and its members. And all the four problems are as a result. And they will say, oh, it's all as a result of lack of resources. What are you doing with the resources you have? What's needed here is not more resources. What's needed here is basic evidence-based understanding that you have a responsibility to know and are being paid a small fortune to know. And that's what's going on. And you have a responsibility, but you're wasting your time. So what can we do? Okay. Because, you know, once I go on a rant, I go on a rant. Now, for people who have ADHD, okay, and this is going to be quite hard for some people to hear, except for people who have ADHD. But this is what I learned. One, don't try and be neurotypical. Don't try and be like them, all right? You're in a world that at the very best may make certain allowances for you, but will never accept you as you are. They're not going to. They may make allowances, but they won't accept you. So stop spending all your energy trying to be accepted by people who are not going to accept you. Most of them don't think about you at all. So stop spending all your energy trying to be, do you understand? Learn what, what De Valera did. De Valera did a beg. He says, you've got to stop asking for permission to be you. But you do need to know how the neurotypical world works. Because if you don't, you're going to be firefighting for all of your life and you're going to lose. They're too strong. There's nothing you can do. So understand your own identity. Understand what makes you tick. Understand the, you know, the characteristics you have that gives you unique edge that will make you incredibly successful life and embrace them find your own tribe okay i gave a talk down dcu all right for layson and the neurodivergent society okay the gay community did it 20 years ago what they did was they said right we have to engage we, we we're not we're not asking the straight community for permission to be who i am so what they did was to create their own community. They will engage with the straight community as much as they do, but I have friends who are lesbians, all right? And one of the characteristics they have is, is that whilst they will be very polite, they have their own culture, okay? They'll be very accepting of me, all right? But at the end of the day, they're not coming looking for permission to be who they are. And the gay and lesbian, the LGBT community did it. Five or six years ago, the autism community started doing it. And hopefully, as a result of this talk, the ADHD community will start doing it. But we do have challenges because our condition is socially unacceptable to an awful lot of people, all right? So if you are ADHD, learn how you tick. Contact me, info at cme.ie. Send me over whatever help I can give you, all right? But go out and kick ass. You're not somebody else's disorder. So have Raggedy Ann here, okay? Raggedy Ann, because one of the characteristics you have is that you have the resilience that neurotypical people don't have. You'll never break us. You'll put us up against a wall. And yes, but you'll never break us. We don't break, all right? Raggedy Ann here, okay? is before I could ever say that I had ADHD, all right, to try and get the concept out, I used to introduce the idea of kind of the Raggy Doll Club. And the Raggy Doll Club was based on a cartoon back in the 90s, which was uh, the Raggy Dolls. And it was the adventures of all the toys in the reject bin in the toy factory. And all the actual toys in the toy factory, all right, were very happy. And it was set up by, started by a fellow by the name Neil Innes, who was one of the Monty Python crew. And if you ever listen to any of the Monty Python people, they were all neurotypical. Half of them were ADHD, all right? But they were 30 or 40, excuse me, 30 or 40 years ahead of their time. 
So in the opening titles, if you're not at ease with your knobbly knees and your fingers are all thumbs, then stand on your two left feet and join your raggy doll chums. Because raggy dolls, raggy dolls are happy just to be. Raggy dolls, raggy dolls, dolls like you and me. And thank you very much for listening to me. I'll hand you back to Ken. Have we got Ken? Oh, my, ooh. Just finding the right button there on the computer. <laughs> now, I don't have my glasses on, and oh, here, here I am here. Hi, Enda. My son is 15, has been through Pieta twice and attempted suicide before. Our doctor referred us to CAMS. Been there for months with no help whatsoever. Felt like shit parents with angry child with depression depression who wouldn't talk in the end we had to scrape money together to get a private assessment he is asperger's yeah odd sorry <laughs> odd <laughs> and adhd anxiety depression and once we went back to cams to tell them that they told us that our assessment wouldn't be any good for saint joseph's autism clinic so no help waiting list could be two years we feel lost as parents my son says he may be trans femme and i just need some help advice what in god's name do you think cams or anybody's going to do by seeing your child maybe once a week or once every fortnight or once every three weeks you're the primary educator don't go out there expecting and finding somebody that will actually sort out your child you're the primary educator learn how to do it yourself we run training programs all right the conversation you want your child to have with me as a therapist the conversation they need to be having with you and the conversation you want me to have with your child is the conversation you should be having with them so what you do is everything you need to know is on youtube everything you need to know is on ted talks go on you know you're an intelligent woman you're an intelligent person i presume you're a mom all right you're an intelligent person you're able to figure out the dross online from the good stuff. There's a very good website you can use called Stuff That Works. And it's run by people with every condition that you could ever imagine. And they all openly discuss what works for them. Try different things. But everything you're describing about you're experiencing, and I think you're actually representative of 90% of the audience tonight, all right? Everything you're experiencing is everything I was talking about. So now you've had a professional from this side of the fence telling you, yeah, the services suck, all right? Second question. If you work to affirm the feelings of your ADHD child, and we know they are many and all day long, I don't know what you mean by that, because if you work to affirm the feelings of your ADHD child, and we know they are many and all day long, how do we ensure that the whole family is not left out in it? Both parents and other family members. Well, maybe uh, how can we get them to problem solve themselves and take some ownership without feeling the encouragement to do so? OK, well, if I go over the actual thing, for starters, you've already rejected them because she says we know they are many and all day long. I have no idea what that actually means. But if they were getting the proper actually, and most of this is actually listening and validating now you're probably dealing with somebody who actually has an underlying asperger's going on underneath how do we ensure the whole family is not left out in it no you don't have to leave the whole family out but it's not the quantity of what you're doing it's the quality of what you're doing now if you contact me in info there's plenty of books you can actually read about improving go online you can there's plenty of books you can actually read about improving the quality of the actual in, kind of listening to your child but if what you're doing isn't working, you have to change what you're doing. The information is out there. 90% is listening and actually validating. And validating doesn't mean agreeing, but you have to validate what they're actually saying. Next, but get involved if you're interested. Yeah. Yes? Right, uh, just, just have, uh, there's a few questions to question A. So uh, just, it'll be probably just easier for myself and Tricia and Terry go through them. I um, just put them okay. to you, so say if you're doing that. Um, but I'm just a question for myself. I just want to say thanks very much for the presentation. As I say, we you said you wouldn't sort of call it, you didn't, so that's great. We really, really <laughs> appreciate that. Um, but you're just saying, talking about your life experience, and you got diagnosed late and what you've been doing ever since. Just a question, just for myself, and it wasn't in there, but and um, just looking at you know what you had been saying. Um, simple question: Are you happy? Oh God, yeah. yeah. Happiness isn't a right. It's a result of doing the right thing. 
Now, my own 12 year old turned around to me one day and he said, you know what? The meaning of life is finding meaning within it. If you find meaning within your life, okay? And for my own self, this is nothing to do with ADHD. This just happens to be my own philosophy. One, I would have very, very strong spiritual beliefs, all right? I am a pantheist, all right? Where science and spirituality and psychology all meet, okay? So that's where I would have found it, okay? Being grateful for what I actually have. The other thing is, is that if I want to have a miserable day, all I've got to do is give myself my complete undivided attention. The more time I can actually focus on maybe doing something for somebody else and the less time I have to be for myself, the happier I am. But yes, whilst I would get as anxious or I would get as down or as up or whatever it is as anybody else, I could never have believed with what I had that I would have ended up where I am. Okay. But yes, I'm incredibly content with where I'm at. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, just in terms of questions, I said, there's lots of questions in the Q&A. So just on myself, Terry, and so I'll probably make, uh, Trisha has the next question there. You might need to unmute yourself there, Trisha. Damien, can you just spread it up? I'm just going to, so I can read it as well as you're reading it, yeah. because if I hear it, yeah. I, can, I can miss nuances in it. Yeah. Right, let me see. Um... So one of the first ones is, and do you think it's a good idea for children with AD to take the medication? It all depends on the child and it all depends on what you're hoping it'll do. If you think you're going to give a child medication and you're going to solve everything, then it's not going to work. It's the same as antidepressants. They are a means towards an end. They are an incredibly useful tool. I do know people who do use medication and they find it very, very useful. Okay. There's only one way you will ever find out and that's give it a lash. Give it a try. If it works for you and you find it's working, then do it again. And if it doesn't work for you, well, then try something else. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I say uh, we'll go to Terry for the next question. Yeah, so, okay, I've got a question here. Should I tell my child that they have ADHD? He's seven in September. I really hate labeling him, but I don't know what to do that is the best thing for him. A very, very common question. And the advice I would actually give you is that it's all in the sales pitch. Now, it's all in the sales pitch. So it's not, it's what ADHD means to you and what means it to me. Now, if your child is ADHD, there's a possibility, probability that maybe one of the parents has it, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to embrace your own ADHD qualities. I want you to embrace the raggy dog club. I want you to embrace the fact that you're a woman. I want you to embrace the gut fact that you're a guy. I want you to tease each other. I want you to make light of it. I want you to embrace who you are and actually enjoy it. So that when you start introducing the idea that he is different, all right, and he starts asking you these questions, then you're able to say, well, of course you're different. But sure, we're all different. And in what way are you different? Because the nicest, comp the nicest, a compliment you can be given by your child is for them to say, do you know what, I'm, I love being like you. So they will find by identification. And when they are actually starting to question, am I or am I this, that, and the other, it's all on the sales pitch. But if you listen to what I've just said, all right, if you put the word disorder at the end of it, all right, then everything you do is you're telling them about his abnormal and that will destroy him. So what you've got to do is you have to change the language you're using. So it's been, if you become a member of the Raggy Dog Club, and if you read any of my books, you'll see them well, how to become a member of the Raggy Dog Club. You're mad. You know, you kind of, you make mistakes, all right? You can't be measured by your mistakes. You don't have to accept anybody's opinion of you because their opinion of you is no more valid than the opinion of them. Then as whatever neurodiversity he actually is, isn't that wonderful? And you teach him how to embrace it and enjoy it. And then to actually do it, join us in <coughs> see me all right and that's one of the things that we do is how to change the whole way that this is actually viewed all right you've got to get rid of the word disorder at the end of it go ahead jeff okay well, just i mean there's probably a, a similar question I mean, you're talking about the label there um, and doing the sales pitch and I fully agree with you in terms of the terminology um but obviously there is that thing around label and stigma um, yeah. so should you tell a child that they have a condition where however you describe them or how do you tell a child that they have ADHD? 
you f- it's the same way as you teach your children, all right, about sex education. You do it when they start asking questions, all right? And as they start noticing that in some way they're actually different, you start, you know, if, if your teacher is any good, they will actually have already started that everybody's different, okay? And that how we're different. But what you do is you focus on says, oh, right, okay. So, you know, like, can you find it very hard to concentrate in the class, do you? Okay, oh, well, maybe you're just like me that you don't have a start motor. You know, if you can figure out whatever way it is, but you start dealing with helping him understand as to who he is. When he wants a label or a name for it, then he will look for it himself, all right? But sitting somebody down saying, by the way, you have ADHD, usually gets the opposite result because I, it's very rare. But some children, all right, when they realize, God, that's the way I am. Jesus, isn't that brilliant? All right? So it's all in the sales pitch. It's all in how you sell the idea to them. But if you regard that as being somewhat different to you, you have to lose the language of me and you, us and them, all right? You have to use the language of us and we, all right? So if somebody comes to see me, all right, and I, they have something that I don't have, I says, yeah, you probably do have it, but what's the significance of that? Because what causes our feelings is not what happens to us, it's how we interpret that. So you've got to control the narrative of how he views it himself. And I have children who do come to see me, and I have loads of children, all right, who will actually see it and they'll think, all right, sure, that's I'm different, but sure, I'm no different to the other people in my class. They all have their, their own issues, and that's how I deal with it. Okay, okay. And um, we'll just go back to Terry for the next question. Yeah, so any advice for a 40-year-old who is only figuring out now that they have ADHD? <laughs> I'd love to know where you ended up, all right? Anyway, listen, would you send us an L email to info at cme.ie, flag it for me, all right, and I'll come back to you because, you know, it really depends at 40 years of age where you are and where you would like to be, all right? Do you find that, Christ, that's what's wrong with me. I've always thought I was a bit nuts, all right? Do you understand? If you're able to do that with a smile on your face, that's brilliant. But it all depends on what you need. So it's really understanding the world you're in, okay, and understanding who you are and recognizing that you're the same as Raggedy Ann and myself. That's the direction you need to go, learning to understand and accept yourself. But if you, it, it is an invaluable lesson. So maybe get some professional, all right, who you do bond with, somebody that you do understand, that you do feel understands you, and help yourself understand who you are. All right. We have a joke, you know, like kind of a, a psychotherapist is somebody you pay money to, to ask you questions. Your wife would gladly ask you for free. All right. So like kind of quite often when somebody comes to see me, I'll often say, you know, bring whoever you want. Do you understand? If you're married, if you're in a good relationship, you go through everything else together. Why wouldn't you go through something like this together? All right. And quite often. All right. Everybody else probably knew it that you didn't, all right? But it's understanding yourself and as to where you need to go from here and what you need to do. But there's a very good website you can look up. It's called Attitude, all right? And it's written by people with ADHD for people with ADHD. And it's done lightheartedly, you know? But also as well, maybe contact Ken there, all right? Because there will be a lot of adults involved in ADHD Ireland who will be actually able to talk to you, all right? And will be able to give you help, in you know understanding the quintessential nature of what having ADHD they does. Okay, just very quickly before we go to Tricia with the next question, and um, you know we are running adult support groups on a weekly basis, um, and I think as, as we were talking, and um, there's an adult creativity group on at the same time tonight, and uh, we're doing adult drama, we're doing webinars like this, so mm-hmm. we do have a full service for adults with ADHD. Um, and I know people can be critical about the HSE in terms of their lack of services for adults. Um, but one of the things they do have in terms of a model of care is that if you do get referred to the HSE for adult services, part of that is an automatic referral to ADHD Ireland uh, for the other services that we have. So we do work very close with them. And, you know, uh, there is the new clinics coming along in Limerick and Sligo. Um, and I do believe there's one coming in Dublin by the end of the year. But, you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, that hasn't been fully confirmed just yet. And so just uh, before that, um, Tricia, if you had the next question. 
Somebody wants to know, an anonymous attendee, can ADHD teens take ownership of schoolwork? Struggling with second year to, to succeed with work homework, it does the minimum possible and gives up on every assignment. No, can you just maybe, I can't scroll into, can you just read that slowly for me now? Yeah. Can, so she just said, can, AD, can, can ADHD teens take ownership sorry, of- Sorry, what's an ADHD team? Does, can somebody explain to me? What is an ADHD team? Is this a team within the school? A teenager. Some... I think it's a teen, as in a teenager. Oh, a teenager. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you said teenager, a teen. Yeah. No, right. it doesn't, yeah. as, as a, it's a teenager who's in second year in school. And yeah. basically she wants to, okay, are they in a position that can they, can they take ownership of their work themselves? Yes, so why wouldn't they take ownership of the work themselves? Just remember, if they are a, an AD, a teenager with ADHD, their problem isn't lack of intelligence. Their problem isn't lack of engagement. Their problem isn't lack of ability to learn, all right? It's actually how they learn. Now, if you use a strategy, all right, you know, that you kind of, that doesn't really work for many people, all right? You know, but remember, she has a way of actually learning, but also as well is, it's not recognized. The problem isn't her ability to learn. The problem is, is how she's actually been taught. And her problem is she doesn't have a starting motor. So that's where you have to start. <clears throat> you have to practice this. And what I would often do with kind of teachers when I be going into schools is in the resource, don't focus on the actual topic itself. For starters, by the time she's got to second year, her confidence is shot. OK, she's now down the dumps. Her her confidence in being able to change this and being able to succeed is zero. OK, so you have to stop trying to kind of, you know, if a horse is already crippled, there's no point dumping more in, information on it. So you have to build up the confidence in who she is. You know, as Ken said there, find her tribe, seek out help, let her talk to other teenagers go on to things like stuff that works, find out things that other people try, all right? Let her find her own community. A good resource I would send teenagers on. Send them on to TED Ed. You know TED Talks. TED Ed students. And that'll bring them in, all right, to a number of talks which are part of the TED network, which are given by kids their age, all right, from a very, very positive perspective, but they will be given by an awful lot of kids, all right, who are kind of have neurodiversity. And she'll find loads of them there with kids with ADHD. The purpose is, is and this will be like kind of my age group. And this is the analogy I'll use for you in, in all this about ADHD. It's all in the sales pitch. Now, when I was a teenager, the worst thing you could have as a teenager was train tracks or braces. It was absolutely, polar. oh, Jesus, I can't go in with train tracks to kind of braces, all right? And it was, oh, God love you, you have to get these train tracks. And about 10 years ago, I had a young one with me, this little one, this young one comes in, all right? And she says, oh, I'm going off to get me braces next week. And in pure innocence, I turned around and says, oh, God, how do you feel about that? All right, they expect to find it. And the mother laughed at me and she says, it's completely different now. Now, because they can get little studs and they can get little this, everybody's asking, when can I actually get me train tracks? Because it's now a fashion symbol. And I thought, who the hell managed to get that sales pitch across? So if your daughter is right in second year, she needs to find this as a positive rather than a negative. And as you start building her confidence, work on the starting motor. That's where the problem is. And then also work on and this is a problem that you know parents would have they say okay he's not able to learn he's not able to engage okay what are they like when they're playing Fortnite? oh he played there for four or five hours uh yeah so you have demonstrated that he's well able to learn he's well able to achieve so do the maths here the problem is the way they're being taught because the computer games industry knew this 30 years ago and what they do is they implement all the strategies that are there in psychology on how to learn. And remember, she's a visual learner. But at this stage in second year, if it hasn't been approached properly, then her confidence is completely and utterly shot at this stage. So that's where the work has to start. Cool. Next question. Oh, great. Uh, we go uh, to Terry for the next question. OK, so a question from Eileen. In your Experience. Is ADHD typically different in its impact or presentations on males versus females? Um, 
Now, this is a question that would regularly come up. It is, it is more, okay, I'm going to hang myself out to dry here. It is more easily seen in males because males are liable to start kicking off behaviorally quicker. All right. It's the same with autism. They're saying that autism actually affects boys more than girls. My attitude is the same with ADHD is that it doesn't. Is that girls with ADHD, they will present with the behavior problems much later. OK, the behavior problems will be much more different. And my attitude and my belief is they're most often missed. So if you have a kid who's cutting, a, you know, a girl who's kind of a, you will often find that everybody focuses on either the eating disorder, the cutting or the whatever it is they're doing kind of thing. All right. And everybody's actually missing the underlying ADD, ADHD, autism. And it's very, very common. So my attitude would be, is that yes, and I, I know the research will actually contradict me on this one, but my belief is, is that most girls are actually being missed. Oh, no, again, I, I don't think the research, uh, I think the research actually would back you up on that. Um, mm. You know, our research would, not our research, but you know, uh, national research would show that, um, particularly in the ages of 8 to 12, uh, boys are diagnosed four times more often than boys than girls. And primarily for the reason you know, that, um, as you say, um, girls internalize, boys externalize, and belt off the walls. And um, just a question that came in there from Joan, and it was sort of echoed by Mary there as well, just a little bit earlier. And um, you've mentioned the starting motor a few times, but uh, any tips on how to start the starting motor? <laughs> how to do it? You have to, you know, like kind of, I said this on a, we were talking about motivation. And if you go, into news talk the heart shoulder news talk look up their podcasts and you look up last tuesday's talk we were myself and kieran cuddy were talking about motivation and i said you know one of the things everything about motivation is motivation is not a feeling it is an action and action precedes motivation so to get going and be motivated to keep going and get the momentum going you have to focus on the startup procedure so first things first if I have to do something that I'm dreading, all right, like say my annual accounts or accountant, oh God, paperwork, I hate it, all right. I actually have to focus not on the paperwork, but on sitting down at the chair, pull the chair into the table, take out my laptop, open up the laptop, get myself started, look in, because all I would see is I don't see the, the, the single piece of the jigsaw I see the whole thing and I think oh god I don't I don't want to have to spend the next two days but if I start off by one step and if you're if that isn't working you got to go even more simple steps but resource teachers I will often say and I had one case of a girl all right and that's what the resource teacher did she didn't focus on the actual information she focused on let's just sit down at the table Let's just open the laptop or let's just open the book. Now, there's no point using a book. You've got to use something visual. You could go onto YouTube, look up the topic that you want to discuss, look it up YouTube, find yourself a decent, find yourself a decent uh, kind of video, all right? Start engaging. Once she starts getting momentum, she starts building confidence. Once she starts building confidence, she gets more momentum. And before you know it, she's actually working away herself. And that, that's the approach I will always use with most kids. It has to be building their confidence. And in order to build their confidence, you have to hijack success. You have to give them a few wins. So the first thing they need to do is get off the radar in school if there's a behavior problem. So you have to teach them how to keep their mouth shut, okay, and get off the radar. They need to understand the politics that understands it, that happens in school. And most of the kids understand it brilliantly. They grasp it. And when you explain it to them, all right, they suddenly, that's what I've been seeing. And once that's validated, that quite often is enough. That's all they need. Then you start teaching them how to engage. And you say, now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to just look up those two topics and I want you to watch YouTube videos. And they come back and say, God, that's really easy. I says, well, tell us what you actually learned. Tell us what you know, all right? And then what you do is they get the momentum. They get the actual confidence. And then they take off themselves. Yeah. 
but it's the start of procedure is how do you start and how you start is you have to sit down and if they can't sit down well don't sit down for an hour sit down for five minutes and it's the same way as i kind of try to lose weight you know somebody wrote a book there some one time ago and they said if you want to get fit pick a route that starts and ends in your door and do that for five minutes a day it doesn't matter how long you're doing it it's the routine you get into and for those of us all right who have adhd we need routine and once we get the momentum of routine that routine actually really, really kind of works for us. And that's what I would suggest. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. Um, and probably just, um, as he says, you're predicting we'll probably run over time a little bit. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll keep talking until the somebody turns off the lights. Go on. I will go, we'll go for maybe a few more questions before we yeah. wrap, we'll wrap up. So uh, I think Tricia has the next question. Yeah, this is just an anonymous attendee. Our son is doing his leaving certificate and struggling with short-term memory issues. Yeah. Any suggestions? Uh, short term memory. Now, if he has actually got the diagnosis, this is one of the instances. Remember, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. I'm a problem solver. Now, if somebody's studying for the leaving cert, you know, it's probably a bit late in the year now to be thinking about this. But for anybody else who has a kid is maybe start thinking of medication. There's no way you're going to do some highfalutin kind of intervention. All right. This late in the day. So what you do is you start using the medication to maybe start to improve the level of functioning. All right. And in this instance, medication would be one of the first things I'd be looking for. Don't start flying. Do you understand? Don't start martyring yourself or start. You need just want to get them over the actual exam. All right. But as regards the short term memory, my experience of short term of, of this is it's the anxiety behind the actual leaving cert that's affecting his short-term memory so maybe you know like kind of focusing on what he's doing right and a little intervention i would sometimes use is somebody will come to me and that says oh do you know what uh, oh i'm doing brutal in school and oh i'm failing this and i'm not doing this and i'm not doing that i says okay well let's maybe do this a bit objectively tell me what you're getting and they get okay i've got 40, I said, what did you get in Irish? Well, I got 30%. I said, what did you get in English? Well, I got 50%. What did you get there? And you'll find that probably they're bouncing somewhere along the 40, 45. All right? And I says, right. You now add up all their scores. And you says, right, to get from 45 to 55% takes 10% more than what you're doing. 10% more if you're studying English for maybe half an hour. All right? Are for 40 minutes. If you study it for an extra 10 minutes, you can get up to 55%. And how many points do you actually want in the leaving cert? Because most kids get anxious because all they see is the leaving cert, but they don't box cleverly with the leaving cert. They don't realize that unless I want to do actuarial science or medicine, I don't need 600 points. So I says, well, what do you really want? I says, okay, well, maybe 500. And I says, right. So you don't need to learn how to get 500 points. You need to learn how to lose 100 points. All right. And then what I do is, is that I show them that where they're at, and even if they're failing, and I said, right, you want five passes in your leaving cert. You're getting 35%. We only have to get you up another 5% to get you over the bar. And people don't realize that. All they see is this huge thing that's going on. So it would most definitely be well worth this while, maybe sitting down with somebody, getting a bit of perspective, seeing where he's actually at and how close he is to getting what he actually wants. Build up the confidence in him. Build up the kind of, oh, thank God for that. I see ADHD Ireland has kind of things on mindfulness and like that. Mindfulness is not about clearing your head. Mindfulness is learning how to disengage from your head and focus on your head on something else. That can be anything. Mindfulness for people with ADHD mm, doesn't really work for me. Uh, I was never much of a meditator. But if I do something working with my hands, I meditate. I find that incredibly relaxing. If I go out and mow the lawn, something that's rhythmic, all right? So it's multiple, but just remember, this is a self-limiting problem. He won't have this problem on the 1st of July. 
So we just need to get him over the bar and how far of a bar and identify that for them. And unless he's kind of getting NGs, all right, he's already about maybe about, you know, he just needs about 10 or 15% more. And that should actually start helping them start building some level of confidence. Hope that helps. Okay, well, thanks for that. And um, just, we did a quick poll there about uh, two minutes ago. Just wanted to share the results with everybody. So yeah. um, brilliant at 60%, very good is uh, 36%. So between the two end, you've scored uh, 95%. So people are very happy with you. <laughs> Sorry, could tonight. you just say that to me again? Oh, this is the feedback sheets, is it? Uh, no, yeah, there's the poll there. So you got 95%. So probably some people, you know, have a bad day. Um, so, 95% <laughs> of what, do you mind me asking? Out of 100 out of 100 what? That it was crap or that it was good? Oh, very good, very good. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> All right. If anybody wants to give more feedback, I do, believe it or not, and this is the self-reflection, I do feedback. Now, I fairly much told Ken I was going to pull the pin out of the grenade and I'm just going to lob it because for parents out there, that is ex- what they're experiencing. That's what I'm seeing every day. If you want to talk to me or if you want, info at cme.ie and just send me an email. I'm working on my own. I don't know how many I can get back to, but please, will you give me the feedback back? Because as a result of this, I am going to get kickback, all right, from the bureaucracies. The the bureaucracies can't handle somebody attacking. So what they will do is, is that they will try. So uh, some personal backup by saying, listen, 95% people thought this was good. That really gives me a lot of kind of, Oh, thank Christ, yeah, because, yeah. you know, I don't really think before I actually open my mouth at times. But thank you very much for that, Ken. Uh, maybe just say a couple of quick questions before we do wrap up tonight. So I think uh, Terry has the, the penultimate question of the night. So, yeah, Anonymous, how can I help my 13-year-old embrace his ADHD? He's tired of listening to me. <laughs> There's only one thing wrong with men. They're not women. <laughs> and there's only one thing wrong with women. There's not men. This is where you need dad. And if you don't have dad, you do need, all right, other male role models. How did, the, did the, that listener say how old he was? 13. 13, yeah. The primary educator, okay, between the primary educator, okay, between uh, zero and eight is mum. The primary educator between eight and 15 is dad. And the primary educator between 15 and 18 are other of the same gender. So that's where the education, so he does need a male role model because one, and this is sometimes, you know, people don't like hearing this. Kids get their security, all right? Kids get their security from their mums, but they get their self-esteem from their dads, all right? Having a good man in his life is vital. And you've heard the expression, all it takes is one good person to completely radically change that. So if he's 13 and he thinks ADHD, all right, giving a talk for a company, all right, soon, myself and Damien are doing it. I've been incredibly successful at my career. Damien has been incredibly successful at his career. I will put myself out on the line and say, I could not have achieved any of it, only that I had ADHD. It gave me the competitive edge and I learned how to ride the bloody racehorse I was on and it made me incredibly and would you agree with that Damien yeah yeah Damien's there behind the thing he would agree with it wholeheartedly so it's all in the sales pitch so send me an email and hopefully I'll talk to him and I'll put him right for you go on <laughs> okay and uh, before we just go to Trisha for the very last question uh, just on behalf of ourselves uh, thanks very much Damien for setting up the lighting and the sound there it's really very good and um, so Trisha what's the, the last question before we uh, wrap up for the night so yet again, in a manner's intent, it's, it's a question it's a question for you yourself. When you were told you had ADHD, did you have a feeling of, oh, that makes sense in regards to how you felt daily or how you have, may have dealt in certain situations? So just give me the question again. I, I, I lost it, it, the second part of it. Yeah, it was a bit, just in relation to yourself. When you, were, when you got your, your own um, diagnosis of ADHD, did you have a feeling of that makes sense? The, the, I found, oh God, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Once it actually started to make sense. But remember, all right, I will be eternally grateful to my boss, all right, because she literally turned around and the way she said it to me, all right, and thank God I was in America because in America, you know, you're something wrong with everybody, all right? But it was when she turned around and says, you know, you have ADHD, don't you? 
All right. And I said, do I? All right. And she says, yeah. And she pointed out the way I worked. Remember, all right, in jobs like an emergency room where you have to be able to think incredibly fast on your feet, okay, they're all characteristics of ADHD. So she didn't actually point to me that the characteristics were the negative ones. She pointed out where because I had ADHD, I was incredibly good at the job I was actually doing. And that's the reason you're doing it. So when I actually saw it, I was introduced the idea that I had ADHD as an absolute positive. It was not introduced to me as a disorder at all. So it was introduced to me. So when I actually saw that, I thought, Christ, Jesus, I never realized that. And then I was able to look at the difficulties you had and think, Christ, that's the reason I had all those other difficulties. But I can actually say my problem was ADHD was never ADHD. My problem was constantly being told I have to be like you. And I'll finish on this. Imagine you're a woman. Go back to the analogy. You're a woman who's been told you must be like a man. You must think like a man. You must, you're not good enough the way you are. You have to change. You have to fit in and you have to keep changing. All right. That's going to destroy you. And that is the problem that all of us with ADHD have. It's been told we can't be like ourselves. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Len. I really appreciate it. On uh, behalf of ourselves and everybody in ADHD Ireland, that was great. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be a reaction over the next few days. I'm sure it'll be positive. Um, as I say, we do have, it is being recorded, so we will send a copy of the recording out to attendees uh, just once we get a top and tail there and put a nice little cover on the front of it. Um, again, we have other events coming up in the near future. If you have a look at ADHD Ireland slash events. Uh, so we've been, a, for instance, we've an American psychotherapist and it's all up doing a, ADHD and families on the 23rd of April and there's a whole series after that and um, so again thanks very much for coming along thanks very much Renda and we look forward to seeing you all again very soon um, on this side of the, uh, the screen and hope thank you, you all very have much a good night. thanks bye thank you everybody Do we continue? <laughs> no, no. Are we off? No, no, we're technically still on at the minute. But, yeah. Well, if anybody has we any other questions, until they switch us off, until somebody switches okay, off the, the lights, anybody has any other questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's lots of people saying that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, well, I'm going to officially end it then, and I'll hit the, the, the end button, and we can all go home and uh, have a cup of coffee before I go to bed. Bye. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. bye.